everyone, welcome back. Today we cover early society in mainland East Asia, which means China. Uh, among China's many nicknames, the Red Dragon uh, stands out, uh, and uh, China eventually rules uh, its empire, its uh, emperor's rule, with what's called the Mandate of Heaven, which we'll get to. Uh, but you could think of the Mandate of Heaven as a value system uh, overarching a number of uh, many, many centuries and, and many different uh, dynasties. We're going to cover the first three dynasties in this lecture, but certainly there will be others uh, as China becomes more and more important as our class continues. As one current scholar says, China embodies thousands of years of cultural continuity. In fact, if you think about it from today's perspective, you could argue that China is the only culture that's basically be been consistent all the way from the beginnings of civilization, that it's sort of been there continuously. Another nickname for China you see at the bottom of the screen, the Middle Kingdom, all jokes aside there, uh, I know that's uh, uh, fiction as well, uh, uh, a phrase in fiction, but uh, the Middle Kingdom or China was the most advanced and developed agrarian empire in the ancient world, uh, at least up until uh, we get to the Romans, then it's kind of hard to compare. Uh, maybe they're uh, dead even by that point, but that comes uh, later on. But what we'll see here and beyond in the long span of Chinese history uh, is impressive agrarian empire indeed. And remember, I'm repeating myself endlessly, but agrarian empires are what we're talking about with these major civilizations uh, that we've been talking about since uh, our first unit on prehistory. China during the Neolithic period, we're not going to go all the way back to the Paleolithic, I have to say it slowly again, Paleolithic, uh, we'll pick it up in the Neolithic period, about 12 uh, to 10,000 years ago, uh, two uh, cultures, uh, kind of separate uh, Neolithic cultures, but there are some others as well, uh, the Yangshao and uh, the Longshan, you can see on the, the left, uh, and we're going to just cover this very briefly. They domesticated rice uh, in this eastern central region of China about 7,000 years ago. So right in the ballpark uh, with other developments in agricultural societies uh, worldwide. Uh, positives and negatives of rice as a staple crop. We haven't uh, talked about really rice as a staple yet, but you get high yields with it. So you get lots of food if you're growing it successfully. Uh, but uh, it does uh, sometimes bring disease with it as well. So positives and negatives uh, as China, and we'll see this increasing through the centuries, starts to rely on rice more and more as a staple. In the uh, Neolithic period, these two uh, cultures that we see on the left and, uh, and below and others uh, started growing millet, uh, wheat, and barley about uh, 2000 uh, BC. So by that time, they're also growing some of the standard grains that we saw in Mesopotamia and Egypt uh, and so forth. Agricultural villages started to pop up around the two big river systems where we first see civilizations, uh, the Yangtze River Valley uh, and the Yellow River Valley. Uh, so remember that the that the places that we expect to find agriculture being learned, uh, developed on its own, uh, are fertile river valleys. We don't need to really go into it again, but remember that in such places, hunter-gatherers are likely to be you know, in the vicinity anyway, uh, because uh, rivers often come with plentiful plants, edible plants, and wild animals who are eating those plants, trying to, and therefore there's often a cornucopia of living things, uh, plant and animal, to learn from uh, and to kind of use as laboratory experiments, uh, which helps us to explain. I don't know if it's the only explanation. I'm sure it's not. Uh, but why it's the river valleys that, that see breakthroughs into agriculture in at least six different places around the world, this is one of them. So the Chinese uh, didn't learn agriculture uh through the process of diffusion coming from somewhere else and they picked it up or migrants from somewhere else that knew how to farm 
coming from somewhere else. The, the Chinese uh, developed it on their own, uh, uh, independently of any other uh, group. So several Neolithic, Neolithic societies, I can't even say that one now, uh, including uh, Yangshao uh, and Longshan, but we don't need to go into detail on, on that. So the first kingdoms, uh, the first dynasties, early regional kingdoms uh, on, on mainland China uh, uh, are three, uh, the Shia, the Shang, uh, and the Zhou. Uh, and they all centered around, at the time, what's sometimes referred to as China's sorrow, as you see, the Yellow River. Uh, and uh, why China's sorrow? Well, it's, it's too... Uh, there's too much to get out of the river, like the Nile, uh, of abundance uh, and importance uh, to not live, uh, you know, in it or near and around it. But uh, like the Tigris and Euphrates that we've already seen in Mesopotamia, the Yellow River sometimes uh, flooded uh, in very unpredictable, uh, unpredictable conditions. So it could cause uh, huge problems and uh, suffering and death, and, and did so uh, at times. But very, very, very fertile soil around it. Uh, something called uh, loss, uh, which is sort of a silt in the water, but when it overflows banks and gets into the, uh, the soil nearby, uh, it uh, turns it into incredibly fertile stuff. I mean, all, all else uh, being equal. So what do we actually know about the Shia dynasty? Uh, in many ways, not that much. Some of this goes so far back into time that it's shrouded in myth. So uh, we've seen that in other civilizations and other parts of the world already as well. If you go back far enough, it's not always easy to tell what's fact, what's myth, and what might be a little bit of both. So I was true saying in Egypt, if we go back far enough, the Egyptian, uh, the founder of the Egyptian uh, empire, uh, Narmer. We don't even know if Narmer actually existed, but he's written about uh, in early uh, uh, documents that we have. Same thing here uh, with uh, what we know about the Shia, uh, of course, along with uh, archaeological evidence as well. So that adds something to our knowledge base. It was a hereditary kingdom uh, uh, in uh, much or part of the uh, Yellow River Valley. So these kingdoms are small at first, which implies that there are other kingdoms, or other uh, polities, other groups, people uh, outside of it, around it. But it's this one uh, and its sort of expansion, uh, the ones that expand beyond it, the two that follow that we need to take note of because they're the ones that have the most influence on what becomes what we now know as China. Uh, so uh, this is a hereditary kingdom uh, with centralized power, uh, at least in the area you see, and you can barely see it in the upper right. There's a little white speck, a little white space uh, in the on the green map there. That's uh, the extent uh, of the uh, Shia dynasty. But keep in mind, we know that China is so geographically large that that's a pretty big chunk of territory. Uh, it, it is. So, but they did centralize power. We've seen, we've defined uh, what centralized power means, what it takes to do. So, this is a, a start down the road to uh, the much larger Chinese civilization uh, and empire. Uh, a king known as Yu, and much like Narmer, we don't know much about the king and are not sure it goes beyond myth. But he apparently had all kinds of flood control projects. I put a question mark because, again, it could be myth. So uh, there is always, as we'll see here in China and other places, and we've already seen it in uh, previous civilizations we've looked at, uh, there's always a connection between large-scale public projects uh, and centralization of political power, particularly when it comes to flood control or controlling uh, rivers or irrigating crops uh, with or without rivers. But what does this even matter if King Yu didn't even exist? Well, what it tells us, uh, whether he existed or not, is that uh, these peoples were obsessed and probably necessarily obsessed uh, with controlling floods. 
So it tells us that this was a priority, this was a problem, and one that goes far, far back in history. We also have evidence, uh, much of this from the archaeological record, that there were already cities being built, uh, used as administrative centers, that the, in the Shia dynasty they were already doing bronze metallurgy, so pretty sophisticated stuff, uh, the growth of cities uh, early on basically concurrent with what we've seen in other parts of the world uh, heretofore. So next, on to the Shang dynasty, which comes uh, uh, immediately after uh, Shia. We start to see written records uh, uh, kept here uh, more frequently, and uh, all kinds of technological advances, bronze, metallurgy, uh, the use of the wheel, and from there, uh, chariots, uh, horses from around 1200 BC, uh, and other technologies, some of which they borrowed uh, or got uh, through trade uh, and diffusion from Mesopotamia and the Indo-Europeans. Those Indo-Europeans uh, were all over the place. Uh, some of this stuff gets transferred uh, also partly by the nomads, who we're going to look at in this unit as well, and in others that follow. In fact, we'll talk about them in their own right eventually. The Shang state uh, monopolized copper and tin ore, employing craftsmen uh, to produce bronze, tools, weapons. Uh, so, uh, the, the, to, for the state, meaning the government, the emperor, and his government to be able to monopolize any kind of resource, copper being uh, a valuable one at the time, uh, and tin ore, it does show effective centralization and hierarchy uh, as well. So, just the fact that they could monopolize it all and basically get away with it, do it, uh, is a sign uh, that this is advanced political organization uh, and effective uh, politics, at least uh, from the top down. Uh, craftsmen producing bronze tools and weapons uh, employed by the government uh, shows us that it's not a free market uh, economy we're talking about. Uh, it's, uh, in many ways, a government uh, a sponsored, government uh, watched over, government controlled. That doesn't mean it's socialism or communism, because still uh, people are uh, able to sometimes pocket the fruits of their own labor. Uh, but China is different uh, than uh, the the West when we get to Europe uh, when it comes to uh, beliefs uh, and practices in the economic realm. All of this made opposition to the state near impossible, at least at the time. We'll we'll see that there's lots of opposition to the state off and on uh, throughout Chinese history. In fact, I should have said this at the outset, but though it's remarkable that China uh, might be, as we said, the one culture, uh, the one cultural group that stayed contiguous uh, for uh, thousands of years, it, it is totally wrong to think that it was stable and sort of, you know, one government the whole time. There's multiple kingdoms, multiple dynasties. We're just dealing with the first three in this unit. But there are all kinds of in-between periods where centralized rule broke down. As you could well imagine, China being such a gigantic, uh, you know, uh, space uh, in terms of geography, it's not an easy uh, place to centralize uh, or, you know, uh, make into one kingdom. And here, in these early dynasties, it's not doing that. It's starting in one place, and each one of these kingdoms is sort of fanning out uh, a little bit further uh, away. Let's go back to the first slide. Excuse me here. But if you look uh, in the center there, a little bit hard to see, uh, but you can see the the years we're talking about here, roughly 2200 uh, uh, BCE, uh, when the uh, Shia dynasty starts, and 256 BCE, uh, when the Zhou dynasty ends. And you can see uh, in the center uh, of the, the color uh, uh, system there, the pink uh, area, smaller, uh, is the Shia. Uh, the uh, Shang is the green, moving out further, uh, and the Zhou uh, is, is larger than that. So the, the, the Shia gave way to the Shang uh, further to the south, um, mainly because they were behind technologically. So the, the, the Shang, not surprisingly, technology often wins in these kind of situations, as we've seen elsewhere. 
Uh, and so the, the Shang, uh, among other things, uh, are known for, as you see on the left, uh, using chariots uh, in warfare effectively. And when one group has chariots, and guys that are you know, skilled and trained to shoot arrows and you, you know, uh, wield other weapons uh, from chariots, and the other side does not, the one side has a decided advantage. It's during the Shang Dynasty that we first see Chinese leaders, Chinese government officials, uh, understanding uh, what we could say is the proper recipe for power in China because uh, of its unique uh, situation, uh, its unique advantages. So uh, a gigantic population size, so lots of people, surplus crops uh, being produced because they were doing advanced agriculture by this time, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, and power. So those three are kind of the triad uh, of a, a triangle that goes together, people, surplus, power. Big agricultural surpluses allowed large armies, uh, and uh, uh, this was really, you could say, forever after seen as the key to the Chinese empire uh, maintaining and extending power uh, over a large territory and a large population size. They also learn eventually to pay off uh, 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 allies uh, and sometimes even pay off enemies to go away. But uh, that wouldn't have been possible without large agricultural surpluses, surpluses as well. Local rulers, meaning regional lords, regional nobles, were subordinated effectively circa uh, uh, a few thousand years ago. Uh, and uh, by the time all was said and done, the Shang controlled around 1,000 towns. So that's pretty effective centralization of power when we're talking about uh, uh, you know, many, many centuries ago. Large cities were already being built, uh, known for uh, trade, technology, arts, crafts, etc. A 30-foot high wall, uh, uh, 60 feet wide uh, at Ao, uh, the premier city at the time. 10,000 workers, uh, 20 years it took to build uh, said wall. So that shows us, one, that there were uh, attackers, or at least potential attackers, that the Shang knew warfare and knew it well. No one's going to spend 20 years building a 60-foot thick wall if they haven't been attacked before. So, uh, but uh, the once again, another large-scale engineering project tells us that this is a wealthy, powerful, centralized, hierarchical society and uh, governing system where you're not building that wall over that long of a period. The Shang kings are the first Chinese rulers to show, you know, to wield enormous amounts of power uh, and to, to be uh, seen as you know, legendary figures in their own time uh, and beyond. Some of this we know from the archaeological burial record. Uh, in one tomb, there were 3,000 human sacrifices buried with uh, uh, the deceased uh, emperor or king. Yes, uh, uh, that's uh, exactly what it sounds like. It shows uh, the, the burial, among other things, burials in China, period, uh, right, to show that there's at least some thought, if not more, about an afterlife uh, because they're killing 3,000 human beings to go in and send into the afterlife uh, with uh, the king uh, in his tomb. So it, it sounds, of course, uh, uh, horrific from our perspective today, and of course it is, but this was hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and we see things like it in other parts of the world around the same time. Uh, the emperors in the Shang apparently ruled by decree, uh, uh, enforced militarily or by political allies if they have governors uh, in far-flung provinces away from the, the capital, away from the, the kingdom or the court. Again, agriculture was practiced on a large scale, uh, um, certainly by the Shang dynasty, and this is maybe the key uh, to understanding the growth of Chinese power. Remember that we saw it in Mesopotamia, we saw it in Egypt, we saw it in India, that uh, right fertile river valleys uh, uh, end up being the key, the foundation for wealth, power, you know, military power, economic prowess, etc. 
Uh, and this is sometimes referred to, though I haven't used this phrase yet, I could have used it with those other agrarian empires as well. But we've talked about hydraulic agriculture thesis. Um, a scholar, you don't need to know his name, from decades ago, uh, proposed this thesis, propounded it, supported it, um, wrote books on it. Uh, and I, I, I still don't get holds water, pardon the, uh, the pun, though he tried to make it extend to all civilizations, uh, even those that sort of didn't use hydraulic principles. Uh, so he probably went too far. But it does apply to Mesopotamia, Egypt, uh, uh, and uh, here in, in uh, the Yellow River Basin in, in, in China. Hydraulic uh, agriculture means that the, one of the things that makes the, the kingdom, whatever kingdom we're talking about that uses these principles, powerful uh, is the fact that they have need to build uh, substantial, extensive irrigation networks in order to feed you know, a growing population and to centralize power. Mm -hmm. So the hydraulic systems, irrigation systems they develop, help to promote the central power uh, of a government, uh, but they're also uh, uh, an, uh, a sign of it as well. Uh, as a very good book written by James McClellan, Science, Technology, and World History, uh, says it, the Shang Dynasty, uh, which marks the documented beginning of Chinese civilization, made itself master of the Yellow, Yellow River Plain by dint of extensive irrigation works. Later, engineers brought irrigation techniques to the more southern Yangtze River. Uh, rice uh, cultivation spread northward from South China uh, and also involved hydraulic control. One of the roles of government throughout Chinese history was to build and maintain waterworks. As a result, dikes, dams, canals, and artificial lakes proliferated across China. Deliberate government policies of water conservancy and agricultural improvement also involved drainage. To affect these installations, massive corvée labor was extracted from the peasantry. Corvée is a word comes from the French. The French uh, did this too, where a society, and you have to be a powerful uh, a government to do this, drafts uh, people against their will, but not for military reasons. That happens sometimes too, but it's like a, a, uh, a work draft. They have a big project that needs to be done. They know they're not going to get volunteers to do it, so they impose a corvée, uh, which means you're drafted into a labor corps that's going to go out for however many months or years, and you don't have a choice. You're, you're, you're going like it or not. So uh, the very fact that they could do this uh, uh, in the Shang Dynasty shows how much power their kings had, uh, and the fact that they did do it uh, right, uh, is an expression of what they can do with that power. Next, moving on to the Zhou Dynasty, uh, uh, the third uh, out of three uh, regional kingdoms we'll deal with here. Uh, what can we know? Well, we start to learning more and more. Again, we're getting closer uh, to the present, not super close. Uh, and you can see in the map that this dynasty is now uh, spread and is able to centralize power over, still not even uh, close to the majority of China for sure. But again, that's a, a that's a large geographical and population area. So government has to be, I mean, if that is accurate, that the, the Zhou uh, did control people that, uh, you know, uh, that extensively, uh, uh, that uh, uh, widespread, uh, then indeed they had sophisticated systems of organization, technology, etc. Et so that the shape of politics in China starts to become more clear to us, uh, uh, especially when we get to this uh, uh, Zhou dynasty. Uh, it's now plain, plain and apparent that it was a warrior society, uh, that they fought the Shang, uh, they fought nomads to win recognition of other kings in other uh, areas. So China has uh, undoubtedly a violent history, and when you see one uh, kingdom moving into the next, one dynasty moving to another, it's usually through large-scale uh, warfare. And not always just between two groups. Chinese history is very complicated, and like I said, there are in-between periods where the dynasty in power at the time falls, and 
uh, you know, for times it's decentralized power, power spread out, and multiple conflicts coming from multiple directions. We need not get into those uh, complexities. We saw something like it in Mesopotamia that we kind of skipped, uh, but China is way more complicated even than that. So uh, just understand that I'm giving you, for the most part, the history of the growth of what we could call the, the Chinese state, uh, but not sort of its down periods where things become sometimes crazy out of control. They organized uh, allies, uh, uh, brought in allies uh, who defected from Shang control, uh, toppled the Shang government uh, in 1122 BC, uh, and uh, in time, as a legitimation, uh, a, a, a way to uh, legitimize their rule, they uh, put forth the Mandate of Heaven, which stuck uh, and became a mainstay of, you could call it political theory, I guess it is political theory, uh, for, for the time. We'll get to the mandate in the next slide here. Uh, what does legitimation of rule mean? Any ruler, any government, has to spend some time thinking about, if not a lot, how it's going to make itself legitimate in the eyes uh, of its public, in the eyes of its uh, nobles, rich and powerful families. Because if you just come in with the sword and arrows uh, and hack everyone to death and say, hey, I'm in power now, people tend not to like that so much, and you have a tougher time ruling. It's not that it can't be done with just that and nothing else. It's that it's usually not done just that way because a new government realizes things will be smoother, will be more firmly ensconced upon you know my throne if I'm the emperor, if we can get the public to stop opposing us, stop rising up in rebellion, Not never even thinking about it, because they now see us as legitimate rulers. And so there are lots of ways that governments around the world have uh, and can legitimize their authority. It doesn't even matter if what they're saying or doing is true, as long as the people accept it uh, as uh, you know legitimate. So sometimes lies or clever myths have been used by leaders uh, in various uh, times in various places uh, in order to legitimize, and it's worked, even though what they were saying wasn't true. If the public believes it and it gets them to follow uh, the ruler, to uh, you know, bow down to the uh, demands of the government, uh, then it's uh, you know, it's legitimized rule. The mandate of heaven uh, from this point forward has long shelf life in Chinese history. And again, this is political theory. It's somewhat akin to, and plenty of scholars have noted this, what in Europe comes to be known later uh, as the uh, the uh, a political theory uh, uh, called the divine right of kings. Uh, so that, I couldn't think of the phrase for a second. I teach this for 30 years, uh, 23 years, 25 years. So, divine right of kings, uh, mandate of heaven, are similar, though they're not exactly the same. I'm quoting from our own textbook here. In justifying the deposition of the Shang, spokesmen uh, for the Zhou dynasty articulated a set of principles that have influenced Chinese thinking about government and political legitimacy over the long term. The Zhou theory of politics rested on the assumption that earthly events were closely related to heavenly affairs. More specifically, heavenly powers granted the right to govern uh, the mandate of heaven uh, uh, to an especially deserving individual known as the Son of Heaven. He had the duty to govern conscientiously, observe high standards of honor and justice, and maintain order and harmony within his realm. So we see a subtlety here in this already, which makes us think a, a, a brilliant example of political thought, and that is that the Mandate of Heaven is giving ultimate authority, absolute authority, uh, to the Emperor, because they're saying the Emperor rules uh, with the, by the will of Heaven. Heaven, right? Uh, in other places, it would be God or the gods want this person, this family, to rule. So uh, there's, in a sense, at least theoretically, no opposition allowed at all, no criticism allowed, certainly no overthrowing of the government uh, can be uh, even contemplated uh, if you believe this. And since this did work 
as a legitim uh, a legitim legitimizing principle, then uh, it, it it had the intended effect of um, causing most Chinese uh, not to question it. Now, since there are so many uh, rebellions, uh, you know, in Chinese history, not everyone, uh, you know, felt this was unchallengeable, and that's why we get to the, we, we talk about a second part, which is where the subtlety comes in here. Uh, you can see that uh, from Professor Bentley's quote, it went to an in individual, the mandate, deserving, uh, and with his recognition that. He must recognize that he has to govern conscientiously, have high standards of justice, honor, uh, and uh, do a good job maintaining order and harmony. So implied in there is that if he doesn't do a good job, something might have to be done about it. Now, it doesn't actually say that, uh, and no emperor that I know of that followed tended to focus on that part of it. They tended to focus on the first part, which says, hey, I rule with the blessing of the heavens, blessing of you know, God of the gods. But underlying that uh, is uh, the the idea that you have to, well, if you're going to be the ruler, we're going to you know, make you legitimate as a ruler, you have to do these certain things, uh, uh, or you know, there could be uh, problems. So the mandate of heaven both solidifies the the rule of Chinese uh, leaders, the you know, foremost leader, king, emperor, but it also opens the door tacitly, however unintentionally, to uh, rebellion. Eventually the uh, Zhou dynasty collapsed, the other two did too, but this one uh, is a bit more important for us to uh, take a look at its decline uh, and fall crisis period uh, followed by uh, its actual fall. The uh, Zhou rulers assigned conquered territory to vassal lords, uh, says Professor Stavrianos. Uh, the vassal lords journeyed period periodically to the Zhou court for elaborate ceremonies or investiture, but gradually this practice lapsed. So eventually the lords, ensconced in their walled towns, ruled over the surrounding countryside with little control from the capital. Which is to say that the Zhou tried to rule, uh, and maybe had no choice, uh, but to rule a decentralized state, which by this time was gigantic, as we saw from uh, the, one of the previous maps. Uh, so uh, they tended to send out governors, sometimes uh, local you know, lords, uh, they, they turned into governors, uh, and they were supposed to pay loyalty, tribute, which means tax, uh, support, uh, supply troops uh, when the emperor, the government, needed it. In return, they received relative autonomy. This is a deal uh, made by, uh, between kings and lords uh, in other parts of the world. Something like this happens in Europe, we'll see eventually as, as well. Uh, there are other ways. Uh, the Kings and emperors always have to figure out what to do with the nobility. Uh, the nobility are rich, powerful people by uh, hereditary right, custom, tradition, law, and they have lots of money and power in their regional areas. And if they get together against you, gang up on you as a king, you could be in trouble. You could go down. So they, governments like this usually have to figure out a way to either get the nobility to willingly go along or at least to acquiesce to your authority. And one way to do that is say, if you do these basic things, we'll pretty much leave you alone in your neck of the woods. You can like run roughshod over the peasant uh, farmers that live there. Uh, you can work them to death. If it makes a lot more profit for you, uh, go for it. Uh, as long as you uh, swear loyalty and stick to it, Pay your tribute, your taxes, and supply troops when you need it. Uh, uh, we'll look the other way over any kind of uh, abuses uh, or anything else you, you want to do. And that can work, and here it did work for a time. But as the quote from Professor Stavrianos shows us, that uh, over time things started to drift, and the show uh, uh, leaders uh, and their advisors uh, seem to lose control or lose track or lose sort of the work ethic to really tightly control uh, uh, this group. Uh, you can see how that would slip. I mean, you're giving them autonomy, which is a word for partial independence and freedom. 
So he said, okay, well, they're, they're paying their taxes. They have for a long time. Well, we're not going to pay too much attention. Uh, well, uh, what starts to happen is uh, these now autonomous lords uh, solidifying regional power bases that start to rival the government for uh, support uh, or for loyalty of the people, at least in one region, sometimes regions kind of connecting to each other. And over time, since they're basically independent, they have their own bureaucratic systems, their own basically government administrative systems, uh, taxation system, uh, soldiers under their command, uh, and even their own laws. So these are sort of states within a state uh, over time. And a state within a state is a dangerous situation, uh, at least on paper, in this case, in reality. They were able to evade the state monopoly on bronze production, uh, which uh, is telling us something, because we saw that in one of the earlier dynasties already, con monopoly on bronze production, which is mainly used for military purposes, military weaponry, uh, if they lose the monopoly on that, the state that is uh, to a local kingdom uh, under a regional lord, th there's potential crisis. Uh, and sure enough, uh, in 771 BC, nomads invade China, which in some that happened to be sort of bad luck. Uh, a group coming from uh, north of China, north and west, uh, and the subordinates who now are used to going their own way calling their own shots, running their smaller decentralized states within a larger empire, don't support. They uh, either just don't feel the need to support, feel it's not in my interest to support, or they positively want, uh, and it depended, I, th I think, you know, from uh, nobleman to nobleman, they, they want the state to go down, and they see the nomads uh, as sort of helping them uh, take it down. And sure enough, when the, when the Zhou uh, uh, finally do collapse, um, we see a period of enormous instability follow between 403 and 221 BC, which is called the period of the warring states, which is putting it mildly. We're not going to get into that. Uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, sequence in Chinese history, uh, but just all kinds of uh, violence and chaos back and forth. And in that whole 200 some odd year period, centralized power did break down. It was very regionalized and not totally coherent uh, in, in many ways because of the uh, of the chaos. So by the 5th century, uh, the subordinates uh, had taken control uh, after this uh, uh, you know, taking down of the Zhou, uh, the last king uh, of whom stepped down in 256 BC uh, and uh, would later become a subordinate uh, uh, to the next reigning empire, uh, which is the Qin. Uh, so uh, it's the Qin, which was already a, a, a regional area and sort of sub-kingdom uh, during the period of Warring States that emerges from that period uh, as uh, the successor uh, to the Zhou. That wasn't inevitable, and it wasn't, I think, uh, clear when this first started. Uh, another uh, professor I've quoted before, Elizabeth Pollard, says, even though the Zhou's or the, the Zhou drew heavily on Shang precedent, their own innovations produced some of the most significant contributions to China's distinctive cultural and political development, regarding all those uh, who they governed as a single people. So that's just one example of many. But they, they had uh, a big effect on the later full centralization of China, though remember the Zhou are st have still only even at the height of their success, they'd only centralized, uh, you know, a, a fairly big chunk, but not even the majority of territory in China. But they were, they regarded everyone that they conquered, governed, as Chinese, and that doesn't always happen uh, in conquests. Uh, even if it's a if you're conquering just out from your, you know, your, your base area to people who have culture, language similar to yours, very close. Sometimes even then. They're, the people you conquer, you don't consider worthy of, uh, you know, being called, uh, you know, uh, the name of your culture or ethnic group. But the Zhou dynasty set a precedent that, that actually served China well uh, over the millennia that followed, uh, and that is that everyone that came under the uh, net uh, of 
Chinese power uh, ended up being thought of uh, and accepted as Ch uh, Chinese. And so pretty soon you get this huge uh, cultural uh, demographic uh, uh, you know, uh, Chinese uh, leaders uh, and public who see themselves sort of on the same path. Not 100%. As far as the economy in early China goes, uh, we're going to spend uh, not too much time on this, but some of this is a technological, uh, new uh, uh, sophistication in iron working, uh, working of, uh, uh, to make tools, weapons out of iron. Uh, agricultural production goes up, so rice production starts to bring in a greater yield. Uh, crop irrigation helps that along. The Zhou uh, were the first uh, Chinese dynasty to use uh, coinage and money for the first time. So a money economy uh, becomes uh, a big part of this. The move to a money economy in any society, in any civilization, is a milestone moment. Uh, things, uh, An economy uh, takes off or can take off uh, in a way that it can't without that. It, it just it, Some of it's pretty basic. Uh, I may have said this even in class before. If so, I'm repeating it now. Uh, but if you don't have a money economy uh, and you grow uh, apples, uh, an apple orchard outside of town, and you have to go to the dentist, uh, I think that's the example I usually use, something like that, uh, and the dentist is in town, well, there's no money, so how am I going to pay the dentist? And there's no phone, so how does he even know I'm coming? Uh, well, I'm going to get my apple cart and fill it with apples, at least what I think... You know, uh, I have to have like, two teeth pulled. How much is that, that worth? So you put maybe more apples than you think you're going to need and, and drive, you know, your cart uh, all the way into town. It takes you two hours to get there. And you get to the dentist's and you say, Hey, Mr. Dennis, I need my teeth pulled. Uh, I got a cart of apples here. And he said, uh, uh, he says, um, you're out of luck. Uh, what, what are you, too busy? Uh, no, I've got you know I, got, I don't have any clients right now. But uh, just yesterday, uh, another uh, apple grower came in and gave me uh, a whole uh, wagon load of apples uh, to give him a root canal. Uh, so I don't need any more apples. Uh, so no, no thanks. So I'll, I'll pass on the business. But but my teeth are killing. I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, a silly example, yes, but it does uh, give you a, a basic sort of way at least to sort of get your foot in the door and thinking about, okay, what does a money economy do that's so important? Uh, it smooths over uh, transactions in a way that makes more of them possible uh, uh, and farther and farther away uh, and uh, without having to pack around uh, a lot of uh, uh, goods. Uh, and so it reduces the, the workload, uh, increases the time in which uh, transactions uh, and business deals can get done. The Early economy uh, in China also, and we're talking about really through all three periods, uh, all three dynasties here, uh, built uh, better roads, improved uh, man-made canals, all of which uh, also improved uh, the economy uh, and trade. Transportation gets better. And you can get products, uh, commodities to and from markets uh, you know, much more quickly. And population is growing uh, kind of along with it. So population growth does, you know, is a sign that only one, but a sign that the society is, uh, at least in some ways, uh, uh, prospering. There were trade links uh, as far back as 2000 BC, uh, as far away as Mesopotamia and India. Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia is a long way indeed. Jade uh, coming from Central Era, uh, Asia and these transactions, bronze technology from Mesopotamia, so they're not just uh, getting bronze, they're getting bronze technology uh, from Mesopotamia. Another example of cultural technological diffusion. Tin from Southeast Asia. Uh, in the return, pottery going to India. Uh, and uh, uh, the Zhou also were doing domestic industries. Shipbuilding became a, a major uh, part of the uh, manufacturing done in uh, Zhou, China. Sailing vessels uh, were already plying the waters as early as 2000 BC. And we'll see uh, later in the class that uh, China for a time had the supreme naval force in the entire world, actually for a pretty short time because they dismantled it. Uh, but uh, they're getting a leg up on the competition worldwide here already. It's probably uh, already known to you that the Chinese in their history have had a difficult relationship with nomads. 
to put it mildly. Uh, and you know this probably through popular culture, culture, movies, uh, TV shows that have depicted uh, uh, these things. Even in some of those popular movies, you see uh, the nomads uh, as a, a part of the you know the plot. So the nomads were herding peoples, uh, and uh, uh, usually to the north and to the west uh, of the regions we've been looking at so far. Maps where we've seen uh, uh, you know their uh, place of residence. The nomads. Historically speaking, and it's not just the Chinese nomads here, we'll see a lot of nomadic groups, uh, right? Uh, uh, the Mongols, uh, a little bit later on, developed, a, you know, uh, uh, carved out a gigantic empire uh, across Asia and beyond. And, and But they're known for their violence in the popular culture and the movies, and they did plenty of that, don't get me wrong, but they also acted, however unwittingly, as intermediaries between East and West, between China, uh, say in the East part of Asia, and Europe, uh, which is basically the West part of Asia or Eurasia. So they ended up helping to sort of smooth, uh, uh, make it more smooth for ideas, technology, uh, uh, religions to sort of be transferred back and forth. They weren't doing this on purpose, but it had that huge historical effect. The nomads, uh, as herding peoples uh, and uh, you know, expert horsemen, but herding peoples, right? Nomads means they didn't build cities. Uh, they uh, moved around uh, with their herds uh, of horses and other uh, uh, livestock, uh, domesticable animals. They didn't imitate Chinese culture, at least at first. Uh, and uh, there were different tribes, different groups of nomads, didn't always work together, uh, get along. Some of them had different uh, uh, ways to uh, to exploit the Chinese uh, empire. It's one of the the dangers of being a rich and powerful empire is that people next door to you, uh, if you can't subdue them, uh, they have uh, a real reason to think, we got to figure a way to get into that empire and either take it down or at least take a lot of stuff from them. And this is how we can see uh, the nomads. Uh, being such a thorn in the side uh, of the Chinese uh, uh, emperors. Dynasty after dynasty after dynasty. Lots of vicious wars, uh, constant nomadic raids, uh, crops, and taking other things. So it, it, it's, I think, fair to say that the economy of most of these nomadic groups uh, were raids. Uh, what's our economy? What do you guys produce? We don't really produce anything. We just steal from people who we come in and, and bludgeon uh, and shoot with uh, uh, you know, uh, bows and arrows. Uh, so uh, this could be brutal. Later on, I don't, I'm not sure that's happening yet uh, in the uh, Zhou period, but later on, Chinese uh, emperors will make the decision sometimes that it's better to just buy the nomads off. Just pay them some money, get them to go away. They're going to take the stuff anyway. Let's just save the bloodshed uh, and uh, ask them what their price is. But that in itself shows you how powerful the nomads were at times, how much of an impact they had. This biggest of all empires that we've seen so far, at least it's moving in that direction, can't uh, completely subdue the nomads, and the nomads sometimes get their way. Elizabeth Pollard again, nomadic incursions shattered the social and political status quo of uh, in Afro-Asia at this time. While destroying old polities, I mean, old political systems, these migrations fostered a new social and political status quo in Afro-Eurasia at this time. While destroying uh, old polities, uh, these migrations fostered a new social and political order in a variety of regions. So they destroy old ways of doing government, uh, social, uh, economic organization, uh, and they don't always put a new social or political order in place, but they kind of clear the way for another one to kind of step, step into the void, although sometimes they do the former as well. So far we've talked really about northern China uh, and not the vast sort of fertile area, at least fertile for rice growing uh, in the south, which brings us to the Long River, uh, or Yangtze, uh, which exists or flows uh, in a subtropical climate, hotter uh, in, the, in the south, uh, and uh, overall better for rice cultivation, where the, the rice crop 
types of rice grown there uh, uh, tend to uh, have more uh, economic value. Uh, rice cultivation, as McClellan says, spread uh, northward from the south, uh, from South China, and also involved hydraulic control. The truth is actually that the farming knowledge about rice and other things actually flowed in both directions. Uh, but uh, certainly, uh, South China's uh, way of doing it had something to be said for it, uh, and some of the techniques spread to the north. The Shang uh, and Shu empires, Zhou empires, uh, helped build uh, irrigation systems in the south. So again, this is how it goes kind of both ways. Eventually, cities, states, uh, with a great deal of complexity, uh, came to the south uh, as well. Uh, the powerful kingdom of Chu uh, uh, was in that region, uh, which we'll talk about uh, eventually. Uh, and all of these uh, societies to the south more or less adopted Chinese ways, culture, uh, to the extent that they hadn't already or weren't already uh, similar uh, in their uh, cultures uh, instead of the other way around. So even before they were effectively centralized, subdued, conquered, uh, you know, corralled, they, they are already accepting uh, the outward uh, influence of culture coming from the north uh, and the empires we've looked at. China uh, quite quickly developed into a society, civilization with a great social hierarchy, though we've seen that uh, everywhere else uh, as well. Uh, and uh, so you can see from our little pyramid there, uh, kings, priests uh, at the top, a ruling class, uh, followed by the working class, scholars, farmers, then craftspeople who made things by hand, because everything was made by hand then. People who had shops, shoemakers, etc. And traders at the bottom. Merchants. And there were actually slaves. Uh, there were usually captives in war, captured from some other uh, ethnic or you know cultural group. They were often worked to the bone in incredibly difficult uh, conditions. Uh, but traders, uh, merchants, why would they be so low? So low? Well, it shows us, we're not going to get into this now, we'll have opportunity to in a later uh, unit on further developments in Chinese history, but the value system there didn't respect trade uh, and uh, merchant activity, commerce, uh, as much as we'll see in other places or have seen uh, in some already. The social hierarchy saw a royal family, nobility, uh, priests at the top, and, and from the homes they lived in, from the tombs that they uh, you know, we've uncovered uh, through archaeological evidence. Uh, it's clear that at least over time, there was a, a huge amount of inequality. Conspicuous consumption, uh, as it's often called in economics, uh, one particular tomb uh, has uh, 11 tons uh, of bronze in it for one person. Uh, so uh, that tells you that whoever that guy was, I mean, you know the name, that person was considered more important than other people who don't have 11 tons uh, in one tomb with them. Some people are thrown in mass graves, maybe a mile away. When you find these two things a mile from each other, you can bet uh, there's a great deal of social, economic, political hierarchy. The nobles, the powerful, the ruling class had full uh, uh, diets uh, of, uh, you know, uh, uh, fairly uh, healthy diets uh, because they had access to all different food uh, sources. Uh, military allies of rulers became uh, uh, nobility much of the time. This is similar also in Europe. We'll see dukes, the highest rung of the nobility in Europe, uh, are really first and foremost military leaders given huge amounts of land by the king uh, for service uh, in warfare. Uh, there's a system of education uh, that becomes quite good uh, pretty far back uh, for the, the wealthy and powerful. Uh, their social relations were very steeped in etiquette and ritual, uh, and it's actually interesting to study that uh, as well. Uh, and we've, we see kind of the, uh, as scholars aren't on, or well, they are on our list, uh, but it's, it, 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 I forgot that part. So scholars are in second place on the pyramid, traders are in last place. Uh, in our society, that's sort of been inverted. European society, it was inverted the other way around. So again, we'll get back to that notion as to, as to why, uh, when we can sort of see it in more full flower in later units. Uh, our 
lovable, uh, our lovable author Bentley says, in China, as in other parts of the ancient world, the introduction of agriculture enabled individuals to accumulate wealth and preserve it within their families. Social distinctions began to appear during Neolithic times, and after the establishment of the Xia, Shang, and Zhou dynasties, these distinctions became even sharper. So uh, within their families, we should point out, most of this is hereditary. So if you came from a family that had lots of land, uh, right, you're going to get that land if you're the eldest son. But the, it usually got passed down the wealth from one generation to the next. You probably already know uh, that China, partly because uh, basically society is almost everywhere, at least uh, once civilization begins, are patriarchal. Uh, but China is famous for a particular kind of brand of patriarchal uh, relations, family relations, social relations, etc. The father of the family, the man, had tremendous authority. Uh, from early on, uh, dynasties were, were organized uh, by extended kinship groups. So oftentimes, early on, the nobility, uh, not just the royal family, uh, were you know, distant cousins or nephews, uh, whatever it may be, uh, related to the uh, emperors uh, or the kings. Worship of ancestors is a huge part of Chinese culture and religion. Uh, if respected, uh, spirits of ancestors could protect the living, so the belief system went. Uh, one uh, source saying, when your brothers are present, you are harmonious and happy. Uh, so worship of uh, worship of ancestors, uh, a tremendous amount of emphasis on the family, particularly of men uh, and uh, uh, brothers, cousins, uh, uh, th that kind of solidarity. Uh, yet again, one in many ways, once you see a patriarchal belief system uh, and uh, ethic. Uh, but it was family solidarity, uh, however sexist uh, it is from our perspective today. Uh, the family uh, must uh, work together. The dead and the living uh, were seen to have it, uh, working together. So if it, if you don't worship the ancestors, the, those you know, deceased great grandparents and beyond, uh, then they're not likely to sort of work uh, you know, harmoniously with you. So not only was every member of the family expected to work together, but it was expected and seen that uh, if you did the right things, but inspecting your elders uh, and your, your deceased relatives, uh, that they would help you in return. There was no state religion, uh, no priestly caste. Uh, father of the family presided over rituals. We'll, we'll get to that in, in a bit anyway. Early matrilineal descent uh, uh, changes to patrilineal uh, and eventually to intense subordination of women. Uh, so you've, you may have heard, it comes, we'll get to it a little bit later again, but foot binding. Uh, right as a way to control women uh, in, in, a w in a way that harmed them. Uh, it hurt, but it also could do lasting damage uh, to uh, women's uh, feet. Professor Bentley, again, Bentley and Ziegler, during the uh, Shang uh, and Zhou dynasties, women came to live increasingly in the shadow of men. Gradually, uh, the emphasis on men became so intense that Chinese society lost its matrilineal character. Matrilineal means that uh, inheritance of land and everything else is passed down through the female line, not the male line. Uh, and when a society is matrilineal, women tend to have more rights uh, and are at least closer to equal. When it's patrilineal, uh, it's much more male-dominated. So the fact that you see uh, China moving from matrilineal to patrilineal in the very periods we're talking about here uh, shows us that it's moving to a more intensely uh, misogynistic society. From the Book of Songs, uh, which we will talk about shortly, uh, we see not all attention, but lots of attention paid to family life. Uh, one passage, uh, Book of Songs, book of massive book of poetry, uh, loving union with wife and children is like the music of lutes, but it is the accord of brothers that makes the harmony and happiness lasting. Brothers, 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 there's a huge emphasis there. For the ordering of your family, for the joy in your wife and children, examine this and study it. Will you not find that it is, a, that it is truly so? Uh, so uh, exalting the, the virtues of family uh, life and close, close family bonds. Written uh, language in China uh, emanates, as far as we know, from oracle bones, first and foremost. You can see some pictures of them here. And, and that's, that's right, they're actually bones. 
uh, of animals that they started to uh, carve and inscribe symbols onto. So uh, right, it sounds odd to us. We've seen other places where they wrote, wrote on stone tablets, uh, like the uh, law code of Hamrabi, Mesopotamia. Uh, here, uh, among other things, uh, at least at first, they're writing on bones, oracle bones. Oracle because uh, some of the writings or some of the cracks in the bones uh, were seen to uh, uh, allow people to be able to foresee the future. Uh, so divining. The, the technology is also from the uh, book already quoted on science technology in world history. The technology of writing developed independently in China. A complex ide ideographic type of writing can be seen in the Oracle Bone script in the Shang Dynasty. It became highly developed with upwards of 5,000 characters by the 9th century BCE, and characters became standardized by the time of China's unification. Hundreds of basic signs could be combined into thousands, indeed tens of thousands, of different characters. Because of this complexity, and because each Chinese written word embodies phonetic and pictographic elements, Chinese writing was, and is, difficult to master. In adhering to the ideographic mode, Chinese writing did not simplify phonetically or syllabically as did ancient Egyptian, Sumerian, and Old Babylonian. But that obstacle did not impede the long, unbroken tradition of Chinese literacy and the impressive Chinese literacy and scientific record from the second millennium CE. So there's a number of things we could say about the quote. You can go back and read it yourself. But the, the main thing to me is that what the author is saying here is that considering the language, the written language, was so difficult, uh, so difficult to learn and to know that it's extra astonishing that China uh, was able to uh, produce so much great literary work uh, and scientific work uh, in you know, a fairly short amount of time after after the writing was uh, you know, first um, uh codified uh, or laid down. Uh, another uh, oracle bone, uh, uh, or uh, yeah, uh, fortune telling, uh, again, divining. Uh, sometimes it was writing a question on a bone and then examining the cracks. Uh, so you write a question on the bone, uh, one side, turn it over, uh, examining the cracks. Or as you're writing, I guess it cracks, uh, and you examine the, the cracks. To predict the future, well, yeah, we look at like our hands and the lines in our hands and, uh, you know, whatever else, uh, reading tea leaves. Uh, so uh, this was one of many, many ways uh, throughout history in different uh, societies, times and places that, that to us strange things were used to try to predict the future, which, among other things, shows how useful it can be for human beings to, or they feel anyway it can be, to know the future. Even if these things don't work, if they believe they did, you can see that they're 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 dead set folks. On, we got to know what's going to happen, uh, and we we tend to kind of uh, you know drastically uh, or, or uh, energetically uh, work to know uh, find out what's going to happen uh, next in our lives and our society, uh, etc. There was also a, a concern uh, uh, for the harvest as part of this. So sometimes they're asking questions. Uh, through these oracle bones uh, to get answers uh, about basic things. Is the harvest going to come in? Uh, what do our ancestors want? Uh, should we attack the other side? There's a, having bad relations with a neighboring kingdom uh, and they look like they might attack us. We'll go to the oracle bones to see what they tell us uh, about uh, a potential war. Religion in early uh, ancient China in some ways, you could say that there wasn't a religion. There was no organized religion, no priestly caste, no priests or ministers, or rabbis, or anything like that. Uh, Chan, uh, the impersonal heavenly power, was a god, sort of, uh, but again, impersonal. Uh, so more like a, a, a life force or creator being uh, than a, a personalized uh, Christian uh, or, uh, say, uh, Hebrew uh, god. Professor Bentley, again, in the absence of organized religion or official priesthood in ancient China, the patriarchal head of the family presided at rites and ceremonies honoring ancestor spirits. So it was dad uh, or husband uh, that was basically the, the priests, uh, and it was all done in the home. 
uh, as mediator between the family's living members and its departed relatives, the family patriarch, meaning the head of the family, possessed tremendous authority. Also, at memorials for collateral and subordinate family branches. So he sometimes presided over religious rites and ceremonies uh, for extended family, which sometimes numbered into the hundreds. So that uh, sort of extended his sway and power uh, even uh, even more. But ancestor worship uh, is part of this mixed in here as well. But uh, interesting here, we've seen this is sort of a new wrinkle for us. It's the first civilization we've looked at where there's no organized religion uh, and no priestly caste uh, that's uh, uh, sort of you know, on the horizon. Thought and literature, uh, some classics are, are laid down here that these will have ongoing uh, impact on Chinese uh, culture uh, you know reverberating uh, through the uh, uh, the decades and the centuries the uh, Zhou produced literature poetry uh, history and philosophy of fantastic quality uh, among the popular texts uh, uh, in literature uh, in writing uh, in the Zhou dynasty book of changes which Yes, told, tried to tell the future. I say, I say, told the future, but whether they did it accurately or not, um, who knows? Sometimes they probably did, but uh, it was probably a, a lot of luck. Book of history, uh, uh, political uh, justification, call for obedience. So the book of history was not so much about history, uh, although there's a bit of that in there too. It was mainly uh, another way to legitimize rule uh, and to get people to, you know, heal uh, and be obedient to authority. It's really a, a way to uh, indoctrinate them. The Book of Etiquette, uh, uh, sort of laid down through poetry and songs and, you know, uh, the written word, proper behavior for elites. So uh, a sort of a handbook of etiquette. Uh, and the most famous uh, and most influential uh, is the Book of Songs. We'll get to Confucius. Confucius is heavily influenced uh, by these uh, works uh, and uh, uses his influence uh, to make them a staple of Chinese learning uh, and education going forward. Uh, so this is a collection of diverse poetry covering elements of daily life, love, family, work, drinking, uh, politics, uh, uh, you name it. Uh, we don't have as much of uh, Zhou writing uh, left as we probably otherwise would because, uh, and we'll get to this too, uh, but the first Qin emperor in 221 BC ordered the destruction of all books that didn't have immediate practical value. Uh, and uh, you can imagine this guy didn't seem the most imaginative of leaders. Uh, and a non-imaginative leader is not going to see a book of songs or a book of poetry as having practical value. Though I think uh, we still sometimes make this mistake even today. I'm biased, of course, but books or subjects that we sometimes see as having no practical value might have more practical value than you realize. We should be we should be careful on that point, uh, all of us. So uh, a couple of little clips from the Book of Songs on the left: uh, the three bonds, ruler, minister, parent, child, and husband, wife, promoted with governing principles, are from heaven. So uh, again, this is a an attempt in the Book of Songs to sort of. Um, encourage uh, and promote uh, an understanding of the importance of these kind of bonds that come from heaven uh, and help sort of keep societies glued together. Remember, we've already talked about how religion uh, is arguably the greatest social glue that's ever existed in history. Uh, so even though it's not a, an organized religion in China, uh, adhering to these principles uh, is sort of a way to use religion. I'm not saying it's been this is being done consciously as part of a plan, but it's being done one way or the other. Uh, so this this is uh, this is social glue. Wise emperor with mighty virtue was forever respected. With the virtue of governance, he harmonized the mighty land. So this is also then teaching sort of respect uh, for law and order uh, and uh, for the system. Uh, that is in place at any given time. So uh, in, in some ways, this is uh, propaganda, though extremely well-written propaganda.